That was beautifully sung. And I saw many people smiling as if they really long for that time to come where we will not only be not far from home, but we'll be home. I want to welcome you to our service this morning. You who are visiting with us for the first time or has been visiting with us for a long time and don't think yourself a member of us, we thank you for constantly being with us and know that we are ready and are willing to take you into our family at your behest. To those over the internet listening, we welcome you as well and we thank you for joining with us today. Indeed, we are not far from home because evidences are all piling up and stacking up that home is not too far away. And it's not because of what is happening in the world that will determine how far we are from home, but is whether or not God's people is asking God to come and take them home will determine how soon we will get home. So thank you. May God bless you this morning. I ask you kindly to stand with me as we read our scripture reading. There are the first two portions on our handout. Those verses there. John chapter 1 verse 4. 1 to 4, sorry, and then 1 John 1, 1 and 2. Kindly stand with me as you have it already there for you. Okay, let's read in unison at the count of three. Two, three. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. 1 John 1, 2, 1 and 2. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us, praise the Lord. Join with me in prayer as our Father hears us and blesses us this morning. Gracious Father, Thank you for allowing us to be your children. Thank you through your son, Jesus Christ, and that eternal sacrifice that he was able to change our status and bring us back into your family in a definite way. We rejoice this morning with joy unspeakable and assurance that the whole human family has been brought back to you. And all those who believe that their father have that experience of becoming your children by faith. Today we stand in need, dear Lord, of your continuous grace, that outpouring of your love, that pardon that you has given to all humanity. We stand in need of that even now, that truly our souls might be watered by your Holy Spirit, yea, Father, by you in Christ in us. Cause us then, dear Lord, to hear your voice and not that of a poor man. But may truly your spirit move upon our souls. And so, dear Lord, cause us in humbleness of heart to submit to Christ. That you, dear Father, and you alone might be seen in our experience to the praise and the glory of your sacred name. We thank you because of your goodness. We thank you because of your love. And Father, we give you the privilege of being the very life of our life this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Well, you know, when you begin a thing with children, you better keep it up or else you are in trouble. Last time I was told, Brother Austin, you must tell us a story. And um, that was from a young person 
But I noticed that a lot of older people still have that young person in them, and they love their stories. This morning's a beautiful story is entitled, A Faithful Shepherd Boy. I am going to read it because it's very short, and I don't want to miss the salient issues of it. So I'm afraid to tell you this morning. Listen carefully, boys and girls, and all those who have boys and girls in them. Gerhard was a German shepherd boy, and a noble fellow he was, although he was very poor. One day he was watching his flock, which was feeding in a valley on the borders of a forest, when a hunter came up of the woods and asked, How far is it to the nearest village? Six miles, sir, replied the boy, but the road is only a sharp, short, a sheep track and very easily missed. The hunter looked at the crooked track and said, My lad, I am very hungry and thirsty. I have lost my companions and missed my way. Leave your sheep and show me the road. I will, pray, I will pay you well. I cannot leave the sheep, sir, replied Gehart. They will stray into the forest and may be eaten by wolves or stolen by robbers. Well, what of that? queried the hunter. They are not your sheep. The loss of one or more wouldn't be much to your master, and I will give you more than you have earned in a whole year. I cannot go, sir, replied Gephardt, very firmly. My master pays me for my time, and he trusts me with his sheep. If I were to sell my time, which does not belong to me, and the sheep should get lost, it would be the same as if I had stolen them. Well, said the hunter, will you trust your sheep with me while you go to the village and get some food, drink, and a guide? I will take care of them for you. The boy shook his head. The sheep do not know your voice, and he stopped speaking. And what? Can't you trust me? Do I look like a dishonest man? Asked the hunter angrily. Sir, said the boy, you tried to make me false to be false to my trust and wanted me to break my word to my master. How do I know that you will keep your word to me? The hunter laughed as he felt that he had been fairly cornered by the lad. He said, I see, my lad that you are a good, faithful boy. I will not forget you. Show me the road, and I will try to get, make it for myself. Gerhard then offered the contents of his bag to the hungry man who, coarse as it was, ate it gladly. Presently, his attendants came up, and then Gerhard, to his surprise, found that the hunter was the Grand Duke who owned all the country's land. Jujuk was so pleased with the boy's honesty that he sent for him shortly after that and had him educated. In after years, Gephardt became a great and powerful man, but he remained honest and true to his dying day. Uh, this is the life. We had our scripture reading, and I want to go over it again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. 1 John 1, 1 and 2. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us, praise the Lord. Much is going on in our world today that says the coming of the Lord draws nigh, and God gives prophecy as a guidepost to his people as they travel along the highway of life to the celestial city. The good tidings of Jesus Christ, on the other hand, reveals the righteousness of God, which is verily the life of the people of God. Prophecy will never bring the word of God to its completion in the earth. 
But the good tidings or the gospel, the righteousness of God will. And Christ in Matthew chapter 24 verse 14 tells us this when he says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness, and then shall the end come. I want to learn the word this gospel, meaning that is a very peculiar gospel and not every old thing that is called the gospel. So this thing called the this gospel is what I am referring to here this morning. I want you to pay that in mind as we go on. The gospel not only reveals the righteousness of God, but is itself the power, the life of God. Not only it tells of it, but itself is it. And Paul here in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, the most familiar verse, tells us, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for what? It is what? The power of God unto salvation, but only to everyone that believe. So not those two points. It's God's power, but to the person or persons who believe. It should be noted that Christ spent considerably much more time in preaching the gospel of the kingdom, righteousness, than dealing with prophecy. But you know, most of us want prophecy. It titillates our mind. It makes us excited. But when Christ dealt with prophecy, it was always in the context of the gospel. And in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, note what it said here. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive what? Power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be, my, shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part, uttermost part of the earth. So note carefully, when Christ dealt with prophecy, it was always in the context of the power of the gospel that is given to his church for a specific reason. Are you craving for the gospel or are you excited by prophecy? Of course, prophecy, like I said, is the guidepost to the celestial city. But the gospel is the power that, in, uh, uh, that empowers you to live the life to reach the celestial city. So it is the gospel, brethren, the good news, the good tidings that is of utmost importance for God's people today. I remember God's servant said, and I quote this from um, Paulson's collection, page 342, one interest, one interest will prevail, one subject will swallow up all others, Christ or righteousness. Christ, brethren, or righteousness. So it's Christ and Christ alone, no one else, nothing else, praise the Lord. Now, in Matthew eleven thirty three, we are told, but seek ye first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. These things refer to what Christ is referring to, what are ever your needs in this present life. God's kingdom, I say, and his righteousness are one and the same thing. You ever thought of that? They're the same thing, you know. Listen to Paul in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, if you doubt me there. He makes this clear he says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It is not that, but it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So you see what, in actual fact, the kingdom of God is? It is righteousness and peace and joy. So our emphasis, therefore, then, brethren, is that the kingdom of God, verily, is the righteousness of God. And we will see more directly, as we would say. The one thing, then, 
which will consume the people of God at this time is the seeking of the righteousness of God, who is Christ, who verily is our life. That's what God's people will be consumed by, the righteousness of Christ. Is it sweet to you, brethren, or is it just another quote-unquote doctrine and has no real pull to your soul? If it doesn't, you need an earnestness about you from God's spirit that will lift up Jesus before you and let you see him in his beauty outlined for you. And in Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, we are told, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That's fantastic. So when Christ, when God's righteousness appear, we will appear with God's righteousness in glory. That's what Paul is saying in Colossians 3 verse 4. Since therefore Christ is our life, it means that the life which, which we live is not our own. And therefore, our topic is, this is the life. This is the life. Since the life we live by is not our life, it means, therefore, then, that we have to acknowledge, as we're going to see just now, whose the life is that you live by, if you live by that particular life. In Romans 8, 9, and 10, from the J.B. Phillips translation, I put it here, it says, and if Christ does live within you, his presence means that your sinful nature is dead. But your spirit becomes alive because of what? The righteousness he brings with him. I said that our nature is dead in the presence of Christ. The nature, the human sinful nature is dead when Christ is alive. And the human agent. Do you know that experience this morning? I don't mean intellectually, you know, because we can know it very much intellectually. That's not the issue. Experientially, do you know it? Is Christ our life today? Galatians 2.20, I give two versions here. King James Version says what we all know. We can repeat that. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life I now live in the flesh. I live by what? The faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Fantastic. But note what the um, J.B. Phillips put it in a nice little way. The part I pulled out there, it says, I died on the cross. The question is, are you dead? And are you dead now? Are you dead? Listen what the apostle is saying. He died, and this is to us who are present. Are we dead? He says, I died on the cross with Christ, and my present life is not that of the old I, but the living Christ within me. Whose life are you alive by today? Whose life are you alive by today? Are you the old living person that we all knew 30 years ago? Or is this a new person? 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is well known to us. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. But that's just a text, except it's a new experience. Are you a new creation? Am I new today in Jesus Christ? That's what I want us to consider today. Because we've been living the old life and pass it off as the real life and behaving real bad in the old life and calling it the life of Christ. That's a lie, brethren. When you live the life of Christ, it becomes, when we live the life of Christ, it becomes evident. It's different from the old time life. You're getting vexed and angry and get off the hand and, and vexed because they won't agree with you and getting on at your house and all kind of thing. That is not the life of Christ. And it, if it implicates me, which it does, that's a lie. It is time, brethren, that we start looking for the mirror marks along the way, the prophetic signs, and look to Jesus as our life and cause prophecy to come to an end. Because the apostle says, at the end of it, prophecy will fade. 
but love, which is righteousness, endures forever. That is what will bring Christ, brethren, when that life is manifestly seen in God's people. The divine human relationship. How can it be that Christ lives within us? That's always a nice question. And for young people, children, I want to engage you. Is this an actual literal thing or is, or is this a figurative expression? To you elderly as well and the older persons rather, is it just figurative or is it actual that Christ lives in a person? And if so, how can another man live in another man? That's the kind of question that children ask. But how can Jesus live in me? Well, I ain't so big that Christ could come and live in me. So pay attention, children. My question next is, and what are the implications for us if Christ literally lives within us? So there got to be some implications. Many are the ways sacred scripture seeks to get us to understand the fact that Christ actually lives in the believer and is verily the life of the believer. The offspring of the divine human marriage was that holy thing called the Son of God. And by his surrender to his father, he, the father, dwelt in him and kept him Christ in all his God's ways. John 10, 37 and 38. You can read it at your own ledger. When the new birth occurs with the Holy Spirit in our human spirit, it parallels the birth of Christ. The Holy Spirit implanted the seed of God in Mary's womb, and the offspring was that holy thing called the Son of God, the highest. Watch where I'm going. Luke 1, 35, 35 confirms that. He was actually alive in her womb during the period of gestation. After birth, he developed a perfect character from childhood to manhood. In our instance, the Holy Spirit implants the fully mature seed of God, Christ in our minds, our spirits, adopting us into the family of God as his sons and daughters. This means we do not have to chart our own path for he did this and gives it to humanity as a free gift, praise the Lord. So you don't have to work out anything now, praise God, Jesus Christ has worked it out. From start to finish, he gives it as a free gift. Let's go further. Romans 5, 18 and 19 brings that out clearly. We are to simply, by believing, allow the fruit, and I use this word advisedly, the fruit of the seed, his fully matured life, to manifest itself in our experience. You know, you see where I'm going with this. Now, Christ developed the character, the fully matured life. And you don't have to develop that life anymore. He gives that to you, praise the Lord. What you need is what I'm going to say next. Allow that life to be manifested through your human life. That's the point. You don't have to work it out. That's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to believe that God has done it in Christ for us and allow him now to live in us and manifest the life through our human instrumentality, praise the Lord. Is it? A far-fetched thing, brethren? Does it look too far? You can't understand it? But let's go further. I say here, he has given us, that is humanity and himself, everything for our eternal salvation. Do you believe that, believers? Everything has been given to humanity for our eternal salvation. But more. As if you get more than everything. Yes, God is that kind of God. But more, he not only gave us all things, he is the all things which he has given us, praise the Lord. Not only he has given them to us, he is the all things. Imagine that. Nowadays, when we are given gifts by family and our friends, they are usually purchased or acquired from some other entity and do not have our actual hands-on hard work or blood, or sweat, on our tears, and their production. In our modern life, we go into the stores and buy um, gifts for our children. Time was when parents used to make, quote-unquote, dolls for their daughters, and fathers would make trucks, etc., for their sons. 
That was a real experience of what God get with us. Not nowadays, we have secondhand works and give them to our children. But listen carefully. Now, the example is God here. The sit, matter of fact, not so with the gifts of God. His gifts are very the fruits of his hand on labor. For example, the city which is given to us for an inheritance, a gift, is built by his own hand. Paul in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 10 says, For he, Abraham, looked for a city which shall foundation. Read with me that last part. Whose what? Builder and maker is God. So you see, God didn't get a city from somebody and give it to them. He actually built that city with his own hand. So God's gifts are not just like our gifts. His gifts cause him blood, sweat, and tears. And we could get that another time. Let us illustrate this. It is like a man building a house from scratch and giving it to you as a free gift. But more than that, Christ conceptualized the plan, himself being the concept. He's the concept. Well, that's what 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says. If you are in Christ, you're a new creature. So the idea of a new creature is you behold Christ. You see that new person, God's new creation. God's new man is Jesus Christ. Secondly, Christ designed the house, himself being the design. And he put all those texts there for you that you can really check and see in actual fact, all has been given to us in Christ. He approved it. I like this one. Himself, the approver, a man who is approved of God, the apostle says. He purchased the land for the house, himself being the land. You know Christ is our land? Again, he laid it out himself, the workman. So workman, Christ knows when you're doing good work or not because he's the workman. That's what he says here. And then he laid it out, like I said, himself being a workman, Ephesians 2. We are God's workmanship. So he has laid out God's workmanship in us. He dug and laid a foundation, himself being the very foundation. Other foundation can no man lay, and that is laid by Christ Jesus himself, himself being the foundation. I say here now, interesting, he poured the concrete. Himself was the concrete, that is, he was the binder, he was the whole together, as it were. And you know, the concrete is used in many instances not only to hold up, but hold things together as in the ring being. So he holds things together himself, himself the concrete, I call it. He laid the conduits. You ask me what conduits Christ was? He was the conduit. There's an actual fact, one mediator, that is one way. The conduit is the way things are gotten. He placed the steel works himself being the steel. And there's an interesting text in Jeremiah 15, 12. You can check it out. He installed the word of works himself being the source, the well, and of course the water. He installed the electricity himself being the power. He gives power in actual fact. He laid the stone, himself being the chief cornerstone. He installed the doors and windows, himself being the entrance, the way. He painted the exterior, himself being the beautiful color, and that's what we have, and we're going to explore that a little further. He affixed the roof, the covering, himself the covering. All of this is in scripture, you know, brethren, so that God not only gives, but he gives more than that in actual fact, himself. He installed all the furniture, that's interesting. So what I furnish you need in your character, Christ has already installed it in Jesus Christ and gives it to you. And that's what Job says in Acts 5. He gives us all the good gifts. Not only food, but all the good gifts. He provided transportation, himself or transport. Remember, he carries us on eagle wings. He carries us on eagle wings. He is our transport. He filled the house with food, himself being our food, the bread of life. Bread and Bible is food. He set up a security system, himself being the security the defense. That's exactly what Psalm 46 tells us. Clearly, that God is our refuge and strength, a present help in time of trouble. And then finally, he gives us eternal life to enjoy the house, himself being eternal life, praise the Lord. So I'm saying to their brethren, not only does he give us free gifts, but he himself is the very gift. But having laid that foundation out, we are going to plow a little further. Can you not see that there is not one thread of human devising or human DNA in the entire package? What we just said is all of that is God. God's doing, brethren. 
and just ask you to believe for it, receive it, and allow it to be manifest. That's all that God asks of humanity. Is that difficult, brethren? To think about it, do you think it's difficult if you are just asked to allow some person to do something on your behalf? No, you just give the person consent. Do it. Okay, go ahead. You have my consent. Do it. It is all what God wants. God wants your consent. And when God gets your consent, you'll be assured to see in actual fact how the kind of life he manifests in you will shock you because you say, wait, well, what, you know things can be so sweet? I know things can be so easy. But you see, it's because of Jesus that things are sweet and easy, not because of you. And brethren, why are we holding back on Jesus? Is there a reason why we're doing that? Search heaven and earth and see if you could find one. There's no reason. There's no reason at all. It is Christ from start to finish and all and all to us. Hebrews 3, 4 and 6 tells us, For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? If you hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end, praise the Lord. So whose house are you? Are you the building of God? And therefore, Christ is the head of you? Remember, brethren, it's a mistake we make oftentimes. I heard it this morning, subliminally I call it. The house of God is the mystical body of Jesus Christ far flung through the entire world, not really known by you or me. Except you are a part of it. So the house of God in the Sabbath of any church over in a particular place, it is part of it if in actual fact there are people who are the household of faith of Jesus Christ. But we must always bear in mind the house, the church of God, yes, it is a pillar and ground of truth where God is exalted, his, known, his name is known in his people always and continuously, and not a name affixed to anybody. Except you understand and have very the life of God in you, you're not part of that building, you're not part of the church of God. So the church of God is his building after his own design and not after another man's design. Oh, I belong to this body church, and true, that means you don't belong to Jesus Christ. Is the church of the living God, according to Paul in Hebrews chapter 11. So anytime, Hebrews chapter 12, sorry. Anytime, therefore, you are telling people you belong to a certain man's church, alas, brethren, you've missed the boat. You've already missed it far. And let no man identify you as belong to a man's church. Away with it. Let them know that you belong to the household of faith. You are the church of Jesus Christ. But we're going to get to something here now that I'm sure the doctor is better able to deal with it than lowly me, but I'm going to essay to go into something here that I want to share with us nonetheless. I'm sure from time to time you hear the doctor talk about the DNA. I see in my another section, his DNA, our life. The oxyribonucleic acid or the DNA is the hereditary material in humans and almost all other organisms. Nearly every cell in a person's body has the same DNA. An important property of the DNA is that it can replicate or make copies of itself, and this is significantly important, both spiritually and physically, we're gonna see the application. This is critical when cells divide because each new cell needs to have an exact copy of the DNA present in the old cell. That is so important, brethren. You know, um, since DNA testing has come in, and I have that on another page, many people have escaped the Heinemann's news. You know, by a hair, by a tooth, by a swab in your, in your mouth, a person's DNA can be identified. And that is why paternity suits and all this are related to DNA. Because if a man disowns his child, and the DNA testing is done, and the child has the same DNA as him, he cannot get away from that child. But what am I saying? Go to it spiritually now, you know. There's a significant point that we're going towards. So it means in actual fact that material that is in me is in my children. And therefore, I cannot get away from my children. The DNA say, hey, guy, these are yours. 
And that is a very important point. But we shall go and leave that with those who can better expound it than myself. DNA fingerprinting, now another aspect, a significant aspect of DNA is very critical here. DNA fingerprinting is an ability to identify the unique variations in each individual's DNA. So every person has a different or unique DNA. It has reunited, and this is interesting now what fingerprinting DNA has done. It has reunited a mother with her two-month-old son separated in a Boston Day tsunami of 2004 in Southeast Asia. You remember what happened in Thailand and those countries on that Boston Day, the day before Christmas. You remember what happened that day when thousands of people were killed. That tsunami. And because of DNA printing, fingerprinting, a child could have been identified with its mother who was lost. The child was lost from its mother. So they're able to do that, and that was fantastic. So these things are significant. It has given freedom to an innocent man on death row. And there are many innocent men who came out because they realized the DNA did not match the man's DNA when it was tested. And has returned the remains of September 11 victims to their families. Those people, some of them were charred way away. But because they were able to get some of the DNA from what has happened, they were able to relate it to who the family was. And that was from Forensic Magazine. And you notice I've quoted that clearly. But we all agree that the DNA discovery was a fabulous and important discovery. I emphasize discovery, for it was always there. Put there by a wise creator to help humans and to teach us deep and important mysteries concerning himself. It was not just merely to find out who's the teeth but rather to teach us something. I quote Romans 1.20 here, which says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Application now. Long ago, over 2,000 years before Dr. Professor Sir Alec Jeffrey, the British geneticist, from the University of Leicester discovered DNA fingerprinting in September of 1984, Christ taught the principle of DNA fingerprinting. Wow. John 3, 6. That which is born of what? Flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. And then in John 8, 38 to 47, he says, and I want you to read that with me, Reverend. John 8, 38 to 47. Zill on, I want to engage you. Let's go. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that have told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and a father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth me, my words, God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, what? Because you are not of God. That is DNA fingerprint at its classic best. You don't even know the father that you're claiming to be the child of. 
but I am his son because I have his DNA in me, but you don't have it in you. That is why you behave in that way. Ah, you see, therefore, then spiritually, what God is saying to us, the man that has God's DNA behaves like Abraham and not seek to kill a person, whether it's by anger or hatred or vexation. That is not what God's DNA is all about. God's DNA is about a DNA of love and mercy and compassion and tenderness even to your enemies. You see what we're making the application now? Hey, guy, whose DNA is in you? Whose is it? Is it the father of lies or the father of Jesus Christ himself? And this is a question you got to face up to. Because all you talk about the coming of Christ and this is not your experience, let me tell you something, you're not even ready for anything like that. Neither will I be. If that's the position. So the DNA is a critical something for us to get. More than that, let's go further. Romans 8, 14 to 17 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, who are they? They are what, brethren? For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry what? Father, Father. So he's really your father. The DNA identifies you with who your father is, brethren. The spirit itself bears witness with all spirit that what? We are the children of God, and the Spirit will not falsely identify the DNA of the Father. So when the Spirit identifies you as a child of God, it means that you have God's DNA, God's life right in your spirit. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we, may also, that we may be also glorified together. Wow. The DNA is showing up, brethren. When you see behavior around town, you know who DNA is getting on. When you see certain behavior, you know who, who, who DNA is still lingering. Now, Christ was always of the God family, the Son of God, by the, fact of his, by the very fact of his existence. Hebrews 4, 1 to 6 says, Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he breath in the first begotten into the world, he said what? And let all the angels of God worship him. So the father identified Jesus as his son. But when we are adopted into the family of God, according to Paul in Ephesians 1, 5, and that by birth. Now, in the human sphere, adoption is never by birth. When you adopt a child as a human being, that child does not have your um, DNA, except it is a smart move that you make with your child, and you don't want anybody to know you play adopting it. If that is a smart move. But generally, adopt, adoption is people who are not of your family. And therefore, you cannot see the child's DNA in that father who adopted the child. But not so in the spiritual realm. When we are adopted into God's family, we are born into God's family, praise the Lord. So this is an unusual adoption by birth. Adoption is not by birth, but God's adoption is by birth. But let me go a little further because time is getting away from me very quickly. It's, I ask the question, I go back again, but when we are adopted into the family of God, and that by birth, in the human sphere, adoption is never by birth, what type of offspring results, and what are the implications? So when you have God's DNA, what kind of offspring results, and what are the implications? We go back to the original. The result is a spiritual offspring with the same divine nature or DNA as Christ. Yeah of God himself in the human spirit now and in our bodies at the resurrection transition event. So note that a time will come that not only the DNA will be in our spirits, our very bodies will carry the DNA of God himself, Christ himself. You can imagine that? It, 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 this thing is a total package. 
fully. Listen further. We will at last have both the genotype, that is the internally coded inheritable information, the character that we're talking about, and the phenotype, the outward physical manifestation of our father. So we will have God's character, and let me tell you something, we will have God's features. I refer to Christ in a very direct way. You can imagine that. When God dealt with human beings, they are going to be so transcendent in everything that the entire universe will be on tiptoe saying, I want to see the children of God. I want to see that God, God's special DNA, not only the spirits, but very the bodies. Do you think that you can have God DNA? Do you think humanity can have God DNA in the body? Talk with me, believers. Or, or, or you think that I'm pulling something? Of course, you can't pull that on your eyes. You are very intelligent. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says, and I want to demonstrate both of these characteristics, the character and the body. But 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says, Whereby are given unto us what? Great and exceed and precious promise, exceeding great and precious promises, that by these he might be made what? Partakers of what? That's what I was talking all about. God's DNA. God's divine nature, brethren. That's what I'm talking about. 